We discussed uh, last week most of the halachot of Pesach, but just a couple of, I'm not sure if we were clear about them. Uh, it could be that last week I said that when we do the Siyum Bechorot, normally on a regular year, Erev Pesach, the firstborns need to fast. I believe we explained why. Because Hashem Bechvodo Batzmo, God Himself is coming to kill the firstborns. So by the last Makkah, Ani velo Malach, Ani velo Saraf, Ani velo Shaliach, Ani hu velo Acher, Hashem is saying, I'm coming to do it. Nobody's above Hashem. The Jewish people might have been above the intermediaries and the angels, etc. By the first nine makot, but no one's above Hashem. And therefore the custom is that the firstborns fast. This year, because it's Shabbat, you obviously wouldn't fast on Shabbat. It doesn't go to Friday. It goes to Thursday. Once the, the, the potential fast is Nidche, Friday is a very special day. And therefore we, we basically never fast on Friday except for Asara Betevet. Yom Kippur can never fall out on a Friday, if I'm not mistaken. It falls out sometimes on Shabbat. But the, the Tanit Bechorot is pushed off. Once it's pushed off, we're not nearly as strict. But if somebody is able to be somewhere on a Thursday, this coming Thursday, a week from tomorrow, and here be Mishtatef in the Sudat Mitzvah. The idea of the Siyum doesn't have to be a Siyum. There's a Brit Milah, and you're part of the Sudah of the Brit Milah. That's great as well. The point just is that you're Mishtatef in a Sudat Mitzvah. So that's going to be next Thursday morning. Again, not as strict. Those that have the custom that even girls do fast. Some do, some don't. This year for sure they don't have to. Quite often when you have little kids, the father you know, fasts for them or would go to a siyum and be mishtatef in a sudat mitzvah for them. This year it doesn't have to. If you yourself are a bechor, it's a nice thing to do on Thursday morning to go to a siyum and be part of that mitzvah. Another thing I'm not sure if we mentioned clearly um, we said that you need to do bidikat chametz on Thursday night, next Thursday night. You do biur chametz next Friday morning. Whatever chametz you're going to use on Shabbat, which would be for Friday night hamotzi and Shabbat morning hamotzi, you keep in a very specific place that is not going to be touched by the kids. Now you say kol chamira ve chamira dika b'shuti. You do that Shabbat morning after sozman achilat matzah after whatever it is, 10.25, 10.30, whatever the time might be, that you need to stop eating chametz, then you would say the kol chamira ve chamira. You would nullify all chametz that's in your house, and it is now no longer yours. So, I'm not sure if we were clear enough about those last week. The siyum is going to be on Thursday, and the kol chamira is going to be on Shabbat. Most of the other halachot we discussed, and I, I believe we said, but it's worth reiterating, that when it comes to preparation, you are not allowed to prepare on Shabbat for the Seder, and on the first day, which this year would be Sunday, you're not allowed to prepare for Sunday night and Monday for the next Seder night. You need to wait and make sure that the time has gone out. Motzeh Shabbat, in theory, is easier here in London because we're changing the clocks on Motzeh Shabbat, which in general is confusing. Many people said you should already change your watch from Friday and just remember for Friday and Shabbat morning that everything is an hour you've skipped ahead. But that way, when it comes to Pesach and all that stuff, you, you, you keep that in mind. You're not allowed to prepare on Shabbat and set up the table. Uh, we mentioned if you're going to be checking lettuce and anything like that, you need to do that before Shabbat. You're not allowed to check lettuce, parsley, etc. on Shabbat. It needs to be done beforehand. Okay, I thought we would discuss something that is very relevant, very practical, but at the same time, not really the mitzvah of the seder. The mitzvah of the seder is vigatale bin cha. You need to tell over to your children the story of Sipur Yitziat Mitzrayim. You open up the Haggadah, and there's a lot of nice stuff over there that's not about Yitziat Mitzrayim. And your kids might get up and say, you know who was sitting in Bnei Brak? It'd be Akiva, and it'd be Tarfon, it'd be Ezra ben Azariah. That's all very nice, and you'll tell me to be Ezra ben Azariah. What does it mean? Harei ani kiben shimin shana. It's as if I'm 70. The Gemara on brachot that they had taken out Rabbi Yoshua, excuse me, the Rabban Gamliel from being the Nasi because he wasn't respectful to Rabbi Yoshua, and they instead put him in Ezra ben Azariah, and Hashem made a miracle that is why his beard turned white. That's all very nice. Nothing to do with Pesach. It's not the mitzvah of telling over Seder night. We're going to talk now about the, the, the parenting and the Arba Abanim. Nothing to do with Seder night. You talk about kids, you talk about the Chacham, you talk about the Rasha, you talk about the Tam, the Shanu, the It's all very nice. Nice Divre Torah. Talk about it on Sunday. Talk about it on Monday. But Seder night of Motzeh Shabbat and Sunday night, that's a mitzvah to talk about Sipuri Yitziat Mitzrayim. 
to talk about leaving Egypt. That has to be the mitzvah of the day. And uh, I, don't, I think a few years ago we gave a class, but it's worth repeating. Don't only talk about what happened in Egypt. Talk about how Hashem was there for us then, but He's still there for us now. Most people here, their parents or grandparents, are not English speaking, are not from the country that, that you now reside in. And tell over the story. My grandparents lived in this country, and it was this type of situation. My father, or my mother's here tuning in, my father should live and be well, I believe is 83 years old, and I don't know why, but this week for the first time told me a story he remembers that in Yemen, he left Operation Magic Carpet 1949. In 1948, they had killed the king. There was a dynasty that was there for 950 years. And they had killed the sheikh, they had killed the king. And they surrounded the city. And they you know, arrested all the important people. My grandfather was the, the rabbi, it was the mori, as well as his brothers were influential people, my father's uncles. And my great-grandfather was the last chief rabbi in Yemen. They had put them in jail, and they were discussing who we're going to kill first. My father says, I remember hearing who they're going to kill first, and the women were crying, and Hashem was there, Hashem eventually, Baruch Hashem, obviously saved us, and we were able to get out a year later, but they didn't kill anybody, and there was this thing happened, and they, were, they didn't have what to eat for a few days, because they weren't letting any food in and out, and they were locking everybody up. I, I had never heard this before in my life, I found it quite interesting. But everybody's got a, got, a, got a story. Everybody's parents, grandparents come from the old country. And many of them have miraculous stories, how they survived. My father-in-law has a story how he escaped Syria. It takes an hour to tell the story. It's an unbelievable story. And uh, we don't have time now to go through it. And I wouldn't do it justice as, as well as he does. But everybody's grandparents pretty much has a story. Where they came from. They came from Russia, they came from Poland, they came from Morocco, they came from Yedin, they came from Syria. Tell over to your children those stories. I, I think I mentioned, but it's worth repeating. I was in someone's house a few years ago, and I said this over this idea, you need to tell over the stories that happened to you. And the host lives over here on, in London on Brampton Grove. He said to me, I know which story I'm going to tell my kid. Rabbi, you're right, I'm going to tell them the story that happened to my grandfather. I said, what's the story that happened to your grandfather? He said, my grandfather was a big guy. He, this guy himself is a pretty big guy. He says, my grandfather was a boxing champion. I have his medals upstairs in, in the house. And he was a soldier in the British Army during World War II. And long story short, he was captured and put in a POW camp, a prisoner of war camp. Now he had underneath him a few other soldiers. He was the, he was the leader of that group. And they were all arrested and put in Germany in a prisoner of war camp. They were there for a while, and they were, treated, they were treated very inhumane. But there was one Nazi officer, he didn't mess with my grandfather, told me this guy, because he was quite big, but he would abuse the other British officers, and especially the one guard, you know, he'd come in drunk, and one night he came in totally off his face, totally drunk, and he went over to one of the British soldiers, and he started beating him and punching him and punching him, and my grandfather said, not on, the, not on my watch. And he gets up, and in one punch, he knocks out this Nazi officer in, in Nazi Germany. So they then bring my grandfather to the general. And he says, what are, you, what are you thinking? How could you knock out a Nazi officer? He says, you know what it's like to have people being there for you and working for you, and you being their leader? What your soldier was doing is against the agreements of what it means to be in a prisoner of war camp. And if you would have seen that, you would have done the same thing. They send him out. And one of the soldiers that was accompanying this man's grandfather, Jeremy's grandfather, back to the barracks, said, look, while you were waiting outside, I got the order that we're supposed to come in at 2 a.m. and we're supposed to kill you. We can't have it that the British officer assaults a German. He says, I've been watching you and you're an honest man, you're a fair man. What my fellow soldier did was wrong. I'm risking, I'm risking a lot here, but you see that gate over there? I'm going to open that gate and make sure you're out by 2 a.m. Jeremy says to me, out of my father, my grandfather, excuse me, doesn't know, is this, is this a trick? Is this not a trick? But he seemed quite honest. He didn't sleep that night. At 1 a.m., he sneaks out, he risks his life. 
and he goes to the gate, and Baruch Hashem, the gates open. He escapes into the forest. Thank God there were no mines, no landmines. He escapes into the forest, and there he meets some partisans, some, some other soldiers who were fighting against the Nazis. Because he was in a POW camp and he was malnourished, they took him to the other British officers. They put him on a boat back to England. He says to me, that's where my grandfather met my grandmother. She was a nurse on the boat. <laughs> she helped nourish him back to life. He was in German, he was, excuse me, in England, and then eventually he gets better and he gets sent back to the war and he was able to take down many Nazi officers. He says, it's a miracle. I said, does your grandfather know that soldier's name? He says, all he knew was that his name was, I think it was Boris. I don't remember exactly what he told me. He says, and that's all he knew, one name, a first name. Somehow, and this is not nowadays with internet, in the 1980s, he tracked him down, he flew to Germany, and they met each other, they didn't speak the same language. He cried on his shoulders, and he gave him a nice reward for saving his life. Everybody's got a story. Not everyone's story is as dramatic as that one, but everyone's got a story. Where their family came from. Talk about how Hashem was there for us. When we start off talking about the four sons, we say, Baruch HaMakom, Baruch Hu. We talk about how Hashem was there orchestrating the whole thing. Baruch HaMakom, Makom representing the space. Hashem is all of time and space. And to create the universe, He almost had to remove, if you will, a piece of Himself to then put the planet Earth. And in general, the whole universe. But Baruch HaMakom, God is all. When, when somebody passes away, the Ashkenazim have a custom. HaMakom Yenachem Etchem Etach Sharev Letzum Nuchshalayim. HaMakom, representing Hashem. We talk about Baruch HaMakom, Baruch Hu, Baruch Shanatan Torah, Amo Yisrael, Baruch Hu. Keneged Arba Abanim Dibra Torah. The Torah talks about and talks to the four sons. Why do we preface this with Baruch HaMakom, talking about the greatness of Hashem? So one element, Rabbi Gamliel, Rabbi Novich, he gives an answer. He says, Adam and Chava, they had a punishment. Punishment was, after for Chava was, it's Bunyech, and then it says, Heron Yech. It's Bunyech is Tsar Gidug Banim, says Rashi, the pain of raising sons. Doesn't say children, so it's referring more to the sons. Nowadays, I find that boys are more challenging when they're younger. Teenagers, as challenging as teenage boys are nowadays, I think teenage girls are just as, if not, more challenging. Quite often, they're not going to be physical, but the mental health. And the, 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 nowadays, unfortunately, it's very common. Anorexia, bulimia, cutting, etc. We had a terrible tragedy here in London this past week with a 14-year-old girl from JFS. It's very challenging for girls. But the, the tsar gidu banim is usually considered worse, especially with younger kids. But first it says, it's bunyech, referring to the pain of raising boys. And then it says, Hedon Yech, which is labor. And they point out how come it talks about the hassle of raising ch boys after, or excuse me, before it talks about the hassle of going through labor. And they answer because some people, they don't have labor pains. They take an epidural. Some people, Baruch Hashem, they have a quick and easy birth. But everybody has Tsar Gidu Banim. <laughs> Nobody's exempt from Tsar Gidu Banim. Everybody has that hassle of raising sons at one point or another, whatever it might be, it, it's very challenging. What do you do? I spoke this past Sunday night for J-Teens. They opened here in London a, a new organization for teenagers, specifically for teenagers. And they've had hundreds and hundreds of phone calls. It's anonymous. The children can reach out. They don't have to feel bad for teenagers. And they've had, especially now with coronavirus, they've had hundreds and hundreds of teens reach out to them. So they did the first parenting event. Sunday night, there was a lot of different shiurim, a lot of different things going on pre-Pesach. They had at this J-Teens over 200 um, parents tuning in, 200 homes, maybe more, because many of them probably had husband and wife sitting next to each other. Hundreds of people. And one of the things I said to them, we've mentioned in the past, you need to appreciate that there's different elements to this makav, coronavirus. You'll tell me, coronavirus, what was the makav? What was the plague of coronavirus? That we lost some amazing men and women. We had some korbanot. That's one element. But there's a lot more to it. We see in the Haggadah, and we might have mentioned this recently, that it says that there was in Egypt ten plagues. And Khartoumim said, Etzba Elohim, the finger of God. 
And by the sea, there was the Yad Hashem. So whatever you had in Egypt, times it by five, which means that by the sea, there was 50 miracles that happened. I have a book that I highly recommend called Let My Nation Go. And over there, one year, my kids were getting a bit bored. Pesach, so I said, whoever can memorize all the 50 different miracles that happened by the sea will get a prize. And Baruch Hashem, my older two were able to remember all 50, the younger ones 30 and then 10, depending on their age. So times it by five. In Egypt is the finger and the splitting of the sea, there are five times as many. But then come the rabbis and say, no, in Egypt there weren't 10 makot, there was 40 makot. Comes to the Biakiba says, there weren't 40, there were 50 makot, which therefore means by the sea there was 200 or 250. Where are they getting this from? Where are they getting this from? It says straight out, that there was 10 makot. Everybody knows, every little kid knows that. 10 makot, the makot, 10. So I saw both Rabbi Rab- Shimon Schwab and Rabbi Victor Miller give the same answer. Of course, there were only 10 makot. So what does it mean there were 40 or there were 50? The makah of dam is the makah that they, were, they didn't have anything to drink. But besides the makah of dam that they didn't have anything to drink, they also have the element that they didn't have what to eat. Because a lot of what they ate in Egypt was fish. Not only that, the fish all died and it, all of Egypt stunk. So you have that mental health that, that it's very hard to breathe because the whole place stinks like fish. And then they also had the Torah tells us they tried to dig wells to find some clean water. There's the back baking painstaking work of digging wells. There's the mental health of uh, most of the plagues, wild animals that every time you hear an animal now suddenly you're petrified, it's trying to get me. There's the makah of coronavirus, but there's many sub-elements. But why do we start with Baruch HaMakom Baruch Everybody's going to have Tsar Gidu Banim. That's one element. But another element is understanding that, you know what, you might look at certain people and say, wow, their kids, their grandkids, angels, my kids, my grandkids, Vildachayas, they're crazy, they're bouncing off the walls. They're impossible. Every kid has their time and their place. I remember I went to my rabbi, my son, Lian Hara, is an amazing boy. 15 years old, wakes up every day, 6 o'clock, we're in the Bet Midrash, he's learning, Baruch Hashem, amazing. But when he was a little kid, I remember I went to my Rebbe, our Berkowitz, I'm like, what do I do with my kid? He's nuts. He's like, oh, what, is it? Well, what does he do? I'm like, <laughs> he takes the, the nappy, he takes the diaper number two, thinks it's the funniest thing, throws it on the wall, thinks it's hysterical. He invented a new superhero called Super Naked. He would put a towel around his neck and then run around the house, Super Naked. And my Rebbe's like, yeah, you got to enjoy him. I'm like, that's easy for you to say. <laughs> what do I do with this kid? He said, if you try and force this kid into the box, you won't be happy. He won't be happy. The schools won't be happy. Pick certain things that are non-negotiable. You cannot do this. And most things, look the other way. Because otherwise, you're just going to be making him crazy every two seconds. Don't do this. Do this. You have to do this. The school complain. <laughs> you have to balance it. But some people look and say, wow, these kids are amazing. I wish my kid was like that. These kids, they just sit there. My kids jumping out of the out of the carriage. My kids can't sit by the table more than five minutes. Your kid, Baruch HaMakom, before you talk about the, the four sons, appreciate, Hashem gives everybody what they're meant to get. I remember I was talking to someone, they're like, Rabbi, I have two kids, Chalas, I'm done. So what do you mean? He says, I can't handle more than two kids. They make me crazy. I said, I, I believe that Hashem gives you a certain amount of patience. So if you have two kids or 12 kids, either way, you're going to get what you can handle because you're not going to get less and you're not going to get more. Hashem's going to test you and give you a lot of kids. So you might as well, and I have more, maybe one of them will take care of you when you're old, but I'm just kidding. Right? You're going to get what you can handle. But you look at certain people and say, wow, their kids are so much easier. Their kids got a shiduch right away. And my kid, every night she's crying and she's suffering. And my kid, you know, has to study, study. And I get tutors. And this kid, he doesn't even study. gets straight A's. Baruch HaMakom, Shana Torah Moisei Baruch Hu. Appreciate that Hashem is in control. Baruch HaMakom. And not only that, Baruch Shenatan Torah La'amo Yisrael. What does Torah have to do with my four sons? Because you know what? As crazy as your kids might be, and as challenging as your sons and daughters might be, you have an instruction manual. It's called the Torah. The Torah is your instruction manual on how you deal with kids, how you deal with, with, with your grandkids. And you just need to have that patience, go through the Torah, take the lessons from the Torah, and be able to live them. Baruch HaMakom, we need to appreciate that Hashem did everything to us. I was giving a shiur this week, and I said, we have, I think I mentioned, we have in the Chazak Bet Midrash, a kid's kolel. 
You have a bunch of kids coming at 6.45 in the morning, a bunch of kids in year 11, Emmanuel, a bunch of kids in year 9 in Hasmini, and 14 years old, they come 6.45, and they learn. And I said to them, you know, we celebrate that Hashem took us out of Egypt on Pesach. But let me ask you an obvious question. Why did He put us in? If I come to you and I say, you know what? I don't like you. I take a baseball bat, I break your legs. I punch you in the face, and I throw you in the middle of the street, and you can't move. You got broken legs, you're out. And this truck's coming right at you, and you just can't move. And at the last second, I grab you out of the way. Am I a hero? I'm a tzaddik. I saved your life. I grabbed you out. The last second, I think most people would say, you're not a hero, you're a shah. <laughs> you broke the guy's legs, you threw him in the middle of the street, and then you saved him the last second? It's not a hero. Hashem, wow, we're on the 49th level of Tumah, and at the last second, God, you took us out of Egypt and you saved us. You know what, Hashem? Don't do me any favors, don't put me in Egypt, and then you won't have to save us. Hashem says to Avraham Avinu, 400 years beforehand, Your children are going to be foreigners, they're going to be in a different land that they're not welcome, and they're going to be persecuted, and then they're going to go out. Don't put me in, and then you won't have to save me. What, what's going on over here? So our rabbis tell us, this is called Kur Har Barazel. The going through of the suffering and the pain in Egypt is known as the, the molding of the metal. Somebody is making a sword. What do they need to do in that sword? They need to take that sword and then you put it through fire and you're able to shape it. If you want to shape gold, you need to melt it a little bit and then you can form it. Hashem says, Avraham Avinu, you're amazing. You passed all these tests. But that's you. What about your kids? When Hashem chooses Abraham Avinu, He says, I know that you are going to command your children afterwards. That's why Hashem picks Abraham Avinu. Because He's going to make sure to instill it in His kids. But when Abraham Avinu, some commentary said, when He asks Hashem, How do I know that my kids are going to... He's not questioning God. He's really questioning the kids. How do I know that my kids will follow my footsteps? Maybe one generation, two generations. How do I know that my kids will last 400 years of being slaves and beaten and whipped and still be able to come out as Jews? Why does Hashem do this? Because Hashem says, I need to make sure that your children are going to be able to be the best people they can be. So I need to put them through the fire. When you talk about Abraham Avinu, we've mentioned many, many, many times. Abraham Avinu, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Yosef HaTzadik, Moshe Rabbeinu, David HaMelech, each one's life was more challenging than the next. Each one had a very, very, very hard life. If we were to say, who needs therapy? Each one needs more therapists than the next one. Avraham Avinu, he's a little kid. His father turns him into authorities. He gets thrown into a fire. And Nimrod's trying to get him. He has to live in a cave for a while. He has all these questions as to the validity of God or the different gods. What's... And then he can't have kids for many years. And then he's told, go. And he doesn't know where he's going. Then he gets there. Then there's a famine. And then, you know, his wife gets kidnapped when he goes down to Egypt. And then he has to go to war to save his, uh, his nephew, Lot. And then he's told to do a circumcision. Then he has to kick his son out of the house. Problem after problem. Headache after headache. Yosef HaTzadik's a little kid. And his mother dies. And then his brothers bully him. And they hate him. And they want to kill him. And then he gets sold as a slave. And then he's accused of rape. And then he's in jail. Poor guy. There's so much therapy he needs. Why does Hashem do this? And we've mentioned many a times, but it's, it's constantly worth repeating. And especially at Seder night, it's worth teaching this to our children and grandchildren. The greatest men and women in Judaism. It's not because they were great that they got tested. It's because they got tested that they were great. Hashem says, I'm going to take the Jewish people and I'm going to put them through the ringer and I'm going to mold them and I'm going to form them. They're gold, but they need to be shaped so that they can be servants. They can serve Hashem. Now that you know what it means to be a servant, you can serve Hashem properly. First commandment, I am Hashem, your God, who took you out of Egypt from being slaves, because you were slaves there, and you're still a slave, just now you're a slave to me, says Hashem. That's what's going on over here. Hashem is forming us. Baruch HaMakom, before we, we can even discuss the Arba Abanim, we need to appreciate, why did Hashem do this? Why did Hashem put us through this stuff? Hashem's in control. He gave us these challenging kids and he said, your kids are not going to be easy because that's what's going to be special about them. I was having a discussion today. We have our business academy and I brought in a speaker and he was just very honest and open with them. He says, I come from a broken home. When I was a kid, I, I self-harmed and I hurt myself. And 
I had to go to a lot of therapy and I was very emotional, it was very challenging and I went through this and I went through that and I went through a 12-step program. He was just very, very raw and very honest, but he talked about how he succeeded. Everybody has their test, everyone has their challenge. Baruch HaMakom, but we know that Hashem gave us this challenge and that's what's going to make us stronger. I often tell parents, you know, parenting is not about raising good kids. And they're like, that's the definition of parenting. I'm like, no, 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 no. Parenting is about raising great adults. If your kid is 15 and they're a straight A student, but when they're 25, they're sitting on the couch getting high watching Netflix, you did a bad job. And if when they're 15, they're sitting on the couch watching Netflix doing who knows what, but when they're 25, they're a mensch, you did a good job. It's bridging the gap. Baruch HaMakom, God gave you a challenging child. Usually those are the ones that succeed the most or they fail the most. There's almost no in between with the very challenging children. They, they either, if you can bridge the gap till they're in their early 20s, they usually end up being superstars because they went through the tough challenges and it made them stronger, it made them greater and that's why they're so successful. But there were those who didn't know how to step up and be able to pass the test and they end up being usually the ones who need the most help when they're in their 20s and 30s. Our job as parents and grandparents is to make sure that they know that they're going to go through the ringer. And we teach them. Life's not easy. Life's not fair. I had a discussion yesterday in Hasmonean Girls. And I said I was at somebody's house and they had loads of trophies. And I said, wow, your kids must be very athletic. And they're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> everybody who signs up gets a trophy. I said, well, if everybody gets a trophy, then ultimately nobody gets a trophy because their trophy is meaningless. Everyone gets one. And one of the girls was like, what do you mean? Shouldn't it be equal? I said, no, life's not equal. Some people are more athletic than others. Some people are stronger than others. Some people are richer than others. Some people are more clever than others. I said, let's be very honest and blunt. If you want to get into seminary and there's one spot and one kid has connections and money and one doesn't, chances are who's getting that spot? It's the one with the money and the connections. Is that fair? No, but that's the way life works. We need to, I think, teach our kids that life's not always going to be fair. Life's not always going to be easy. But when you persevere through the challenges, that's what forms you and what makes you who you are. Hashem says, I need these people to be the Jewish people. But therefore, I need them to go through the tests just like you went through the tests, Avraham. And Avraham, what did he do? He led by example. Laman Hashem Tzaveh et Beto Aharav. Doesn't Laman Hashem Tzaveh et Beto Aharav. They're going to follow him. They're going to follow in his footsteps. They're going to say, look how Avraham acted. That's how I act. If we want our children to be great, we need to be great as well. And they will follow in our footsteps. Be'ezat Hashem. The night of Pesach is the night that we reaffirm our Amuna and we trust Hashem, you gave me this challenging kid. I understand that's my tikkun. That's there, that's why I'm in this world. And the women, even more so than the men. We're there to have patience for our children, for the grandchildren, no matter what they throw at us, no matter how they behave, no matter how challenging it must be. It says, Va'eten, we say in the Haggadah, Va'eten et Yitzchak, Va'eten lo et Yaakov et Esav. Doesn't say Va'eten means, and I gave them. Specifically, they had these character traits and these flaws and these challenges, and I gave them to you, Yitzchak. You have an Esav in your house. Remember, I was at a dinner one time, they asked me to be the speaker, and I'm on the dais with all these big rabbis. I'm not sure why they asked me, but I was very honored. And someone comes and says, Rabbi Levi, I understand you deal with teenagers. I said, yeah. They start asking me all these questions, and I gave them my, my humble opinion. And the rabbi next to me says, you know, great advice. People think that it's their fault. It says, you look at certain families, they have 10 kids, 9 of them, gems, diamonds. And the last one has got issues. What, you think the parents suddenly forgot how to, how to parent? How to be good parents? They forgot all their parenting tips and advice? You look at Yitzchak Avinu, he's got a Yaakov. Wow, amazing parents, Yitzchak and Rivka. But they also have a, an Esav. What, what happened? You can lead the horse to the water, he needs to choose to drink. If Hashem gave you this kid, Va'eten, remember that God gave this to you, and that is your test. That, that's what it's all about. You know, when we look at the different sons, so we've spoken in the past about the Chacham and what makes him the Chacham. He's able to categorize the different steps and the different stages. And it doesn't say that you should give the Chacham a nice, simple answer, a fluffy answer, a nice story. He's a clever kid. You need to treat your kid who's intellectual as an intellectual. It's not one size fits all in parenting. So if your kid's a Chacham, he's a very clever kid. She's a very clever girl. What do you do? You teach them. You go from beginning of the halachot to the end. Teach them on a high level. 
It's not going to be easy. This is the halachot. This is what we do. This is what we... That, that, that's what it's all about. You teach the Chacham on his level. And the Rasha. What do we do to the Rasha? Haket Shinav. You punch him in the teeth. Now it's very interesting because when you look in the Chumash, in Parashat Bo, it uses a plural terminology. And if your children, not your son, your children will ask you tomorrow, and it doesn't say over there, and it says that question, right? Right? What are you guys doing? It doesn't say in the Torah, Haket Shinav, knock him in the teeth. What does the Torah say? You give them a nice answer. So they ask, why in the Torah is given a nice answer? In the Haggadah, you knock out his teeth. It says it depends. Every son doesn't start off good. Every child for 13 years has only a Yetzirah and no Yetzirah Tov. Then they become Bar Mitzvah, they get a Yetzirah Tov. And the Yetzirah now ups its game. And you go through the front lobal element of teenagers. And therefore, they know they're just being teenagers when they react certain ways. Okay. Very true, very nice. But nobody starts off wanting to give. <laughs> All kids start off wanting to take, wanting to get. Our job is to train them that we're here in this world to help, to think of others, and to give. But every, every kid's like, why should I bother? Every kid is lazy. <laughs> That's just the reality of the situation. Now, you might have trained them already from a young age, but no kid wants to clean up their toys. I never found a kid. Hey, who wants to clean up? Me, 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 me. In the bar, cousin. You got to make a chart. You make a prize. You incentivize them. You tell them you can't. You know, do this until you clean up. But no kid naturally wants to clean up. No kid naturally wants to do homework. Kids are naturally not interested. So when you tell the kid, come to the seder, the natural question is, why should I? They're not being bad or negative. They're just being kids. We were the same way when we were their age. So what do you need to do? You need to explain to them and incentivize them. You need to make it nice and calm and enjoyable. The rasha is already different. The rasha already has heard all the answers. This Rasha, he knows all the information. When the kid in the Torah, the kid who comes, he's just asking innocently, what, what's the deal? Why are we doing this? And I don't want to have to work hard if I don't need to. So you explain to him. He says, okay, that makes sense. I'm going to do it. The Rasha has heard the answers and he still says, no, I'm not interested. That, that kid, you, you got to be forceful. You got to be a bit of a bully. You got to show him. It's not, it's not up for debate. It's not if you like it. This is what we do. And you should know. If you would have been in Egypt, chances are you wouldn't have got out. But that's not equal. That's not fair. No one said life's fair. You behave well, you get redeemed. You don't behave well, you don't get redeemed. There's ramifications for your actions. It's not all going to be fun and games. Life's not going to be easy. You're going to be put through the ringer. And you got to be a religious Jew. And it's not always going to be... But that's what it's all about. That's what we're doing over here. That's what we teach the Rasha. We say in the Haggadah, Arami Oved Avi and Lavan... He wanted to excuse me. He wanted to eradicate everything. Now in the Torah, it tells us straight out that Paro wants to get rid of the Jews. We don't see anywhere that that Lavan wants to. At the end, when Yaakov is leaving with Rachel and Leah and the kids, then Lavan says, "Hey, hey, hey, Abanim Banai, they're mine. You can't take them." But otherwise, we don't see anywhere that Bikesh Lavan la Kodet Akol that Lavan wants to get rid of the Jewish people. So I was listening to Shur from Rabbi Mansur, which is where I heard many of these ideas. And he said, beautiful. For 20 years, what's Lavan doing to Yaakov? He's playing games and he's playing mind games and he's tricking him. And he says, you're going to work for this one. And then he pulls the switcheroo and he marries that one. And the whole time you're going to get spotted, you're going to get speckled, you're going to get striped. Every time they make a deal, he changes the deal. Because what does Lavan want? He wants Yaakov to get angry. He wants Yaakov to freak out. He wants Yaakov to start screaming and cursing. And then that will ruin the Chinuch. Because Chinuch is only... Your kids see how you act, and then they follow suit. Lavan's hoping if I make Yaakov lose his cool, I make Yaakov into someone who's dishonest, then that's it. There's not going to be any Jews. There's not going to be a perpetuation of the legacy of Abraham and Yitzchak, because the kids are going to see my daddy, he screams. My daddy, he curses. My daddy's not honest. So I'll do everything I possibly can to make Yaakov crazy and ruin Yaakov. And that is... He was trying to get Yaakov to get upset. And, and at one point, he even does. Yaakov gets upset. He gets upset. But that was already when he was leaving. Yaakov comes to Rachel and says, I, I don't look at your father the way I used to. His face is different. We've mentioned the past. I used to look at him, excuse me, and think he's a thief. Now I think, good businessman. I got to get out of here. Otherwise, our kids will end up being Ramaim, will end up being thieves 
and conniving people that aren't emet, that aren't truthful. Yaakov Avinu lived the life, and therefore his parent, excuse me, his children followed suit. That's the way it works. Now there are exceptions. You're going to have a Yitzchak and a Rivka who sometimes have an Esav. True. And you might have a, a good person that has the Rasha, that's negative, that's down. Sometimes it's not the parent's fault. Quite often it is. But sometimes they weren't able to adjust. They're good parents, but they thought everybody goes to the same school. And they thought everybody gets the same situation. No. Every kid needs something different. Some need discipline. Some need TLC. Some kids need to be treated very intellectually. Some kids, they're not especially intellectual. Treat them as such, even if the other kids are more intellectual. Some kids need a tutor. Some kids don't need a tutor. Appreciate your child. Know their strengths and their weaknesses. But as parents, we need to be role models. That's what we need to do. That's what we need to be. And we understand that that's the way it works. We say in the Shema, right? The, the Gemara says, if somebody says the Shema, and they talk about wearing tefillin in the Shema, but they don't wear tefillin, they're testifying falsely against themselves. It also says in the Shema, right? We say, and needs to be on your heart, you need to live it. And then when you live it, you need to teach it to your kids. You need to talk about them. You need to always have a way of making the Torah interesting and exciting. It says certain commentaries. The same way it talks about tefillin, and if you don't wear tefillin, you're testifying falsely against yourself, it's a big sin. If you say the Shema and you don't do your best to live the life that you tell your kids to live, if you don't do your best to make the Torah exciting, you're also testifying falsely against yourself. Because you said, You should teach your kids. That's what we say in the Shema every day, both paragraphs and three times a day. You know, we're saying this concept. When you're traveling, when you're going in my car, you ask my kids, what do I do in the car? I'm listening to Shiurim, listening to CDs. When you're traveling, you could be going, you're exercising, you got the AirPods, I'm listening to a shiur. If that works for you. Some people, it's not that easy to exercise unless they have music. Or a shiur definitely won't do it for them. To each their own. But you want your kids knowing that, right? We've said over the story in the past about this guy. He used to wake up 6 a.m., go learn. And he had a very physically manual labor, very tiring job. He would get home at 8 o'clock, eat chicken. He was falling on his face every night to go to the shiur. And usually within two, max five minutes, he's sleeping at the shiur. And this is going on for a while. So one time after the class, the rabbi comes and says, Mr. Cohen, you know, I'm very honored that you come to the shiur, but you don't ever make it more than three to five minutes. Why don't you just stay home and sleep? Be comfortable. He says, Rabbi, my kids don't know that I fall asleep at the shiur. My kids know after a long day at work, you go and you learn. <laughs> That's what I want my kids to learn. That's what I want my kids to know. Eh, they might not be as tired as I am. My kids, the rabbi was uh, blown away. He says, no problem. I'm going to start bringing you a pillow. You want to sleep? You sleep. <laughs> do whatever you got to do. But it's amazing that you want to come because you want to teach your kids. That's what you do after a long day. This kid's kolel. I don't expect any of these guys to be rabbis, but I want them to know. You wake up, you learn, you pray, and then you start your day. So if I have to bribe them a little bit and they're getting a couple of pounds every day to come learn at 6.45, great. Because we're training them. We're teaching them. You give your kid tzedakah. Every day he puts in the pushka. Why? He's a kid. He's giving money. He puts it in. That trains him that when he's 25 and 30 and 40, they go around and you give tzedakah. It's what you do. They ask for money. You help out as much as you can. There's nothing to think about. It's innate nature. My parents did it. I do it. There's a story uh, with Reb Alchanan Wasserman. There was a very wealthy man in the 1920s called Mr. Dennis. And he gave a lot of money. Unfortunately, in the Great Depression, he lost a lot of his money. Or most of his money. But Reb Alchanan Wasserman told the story that one time it was raining. And it was very muddy. And he was due to have a meeting with Mr. Dennis. He doesn't want to get the whole house full of mud. He's soaking wet. He's going to sit on the couch and ruin the couch and make it wet. So he comes to the back door, knocks on the back door, comes in. And he's waiting there. And Mr. Dennis says, please come in. He comes in and there's mud all over the place. And Mr. Dennis says to Rukhan of Asman, I don't understand. Why, why why'd you come through the back door? He says, I don't want to get mud all over the place. Mr. Dennis says, no, 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 no. You don't understand how hard I've worked. You need to come in the front door. You need to get mud everywhere. I want you to sit, not just on one couch, move from one couch to the next, get them all wet. Rabbi Hanan says, what? Why? He says, I want my kids to know 
Respect for rabbis. Kavodah Torah comes before mud and respect for your carpet and before respect for your couch. So do me a favor. I've been doing my best to train them to respect Torah and respect rabbis. You coming through the back door makes it seem like, oh, the rabbi, you know, he's a, the back option. Really, it's not ideal. And you come through the back door and, you know, I don't really want him in my house. You walk through that front door. I'm going to call my kids. He calls the kids down. Rabbi Khan comes two minutes later and the kids, they're like, there's mud all over the white carpet. He sat on one couch and then Rabbi Khan went to sit on the other couch and the other couch. And Mr. Dennis the whole time has a big smile. The kids are looking. How's dad going to react? And he's got a big smile. Why? Because he wanted to teach his kids. Don't just listen to what I say. Look how I act, and you need to act the same way. How I treat the rabbi, how I treat the Bet Knesset. Follow what I do, not what I say. You need to say, but you need to live as a parent. When you have the Rasha, if he's still there, you got to be tough with him. You got to tell him that you know, life's not easy. Life's not always fair. But you need, to, you need to up your game. You need to treat a bully like a bully. And step up to the plate. And if you have a tam, you have a simple son, you treat him simply. Speak his language. If you have a she'ena, you de'al de'shol. Some people, they have a special needs kid. He also comes to the Seder. He can't even talk. If you look in Rashi, Parashat Vayet Hanan, talks about the tam. What is the tam's question? Mazot. What's this? You don't get a lower level of intelligence than what's this. Rashi over there says, Tinok Tipesh. It's a child, and not just a child, a stupid child. Tinok Tipesh. Mazot. But that's okay. You have a kid, he's not very clever. No problem. You deal with him accordingly. And you explain it to him. And you make it fun for him. You tell him stories and fun and games. But you get him involved. And even the She'enu Yodea Lishol, the special needs kid who can't even talk, the one who's an Elim, he's also by the Seder. At Pitachlo, go out of your way. Do whatever you can for that child. Help them. Understand that they have a special Neshama. We've often told over the story, we'll end with this. Of the Chazon Ish, this woman comes with her special needs child. And she wheels in the wheelchair. The child could barely move. The Chazon Ish, a few weeks before he passed away, painstakingly stands up, sits back down. The woman says, Rabbi, why are you standing up, standing up for my child? Chazon Ish says, every person is sent into this world with a mission. And they're given the tools to accomplish their mission. Your child doesn't have the tools that you or I have. Your child has a very holy, very, very special neshama and just needs to do a, a little, a very small mission. Such a holy neshama I shouldn't stand up for. This she'eno yodea lishol, this special needs child, also bring him to the Seder. Understand that he has a role to play as well. And at petachlo, you go and do everything you possibly can to help this child, to be there for this child. Understand this child is a very holy, special neshama and needs to be treated accordingly. It's not a hassle, it's a privilege. And again, it's easy to say, especially if someone doesn't have that type of child, but ultimately, it's a, it's a privilege. I was talking to a friend of mine, he has a special needs brother. He said, everyone I've spoken to that has a special needs sibling has said how they bring the family together and, and it might be challenging, but they, they, make, they make the family stronger, better, a tighter knit family, and in general, just it makes, it makes us the family that we are, having this child, that everybody has their role to play and help out and do whatever it is. At petachlo, you get involved. Some say at is referring to the woman. Some say not. At petachlo, your job is to get that child involved. Each child is a test. But baruch hamakom, the special needs child is a test and the stupid or simple child is a test and the rasha is a test and even the chacham, the very intellectual child, especially if you're not intellectual, now you need to know how to deal with this child that doesn't speak your language. And if you are very intellectual and your kid's just a simple kid and you want to get him these top tutors and have him go to Cambridge and Oxford and that's just not their thing, it, it's challenging for you. You know, I, I, I don't want, this kid is not, is not doing what I, what I always foresaw and dreamed. Doesn't matter what you dreamed. <laughs> you got given this child that has those strengths and those weaknesses. You need to adapt. And you need to be there for that child and it's not easy. Baruch HaMakom. Remember, Hashem did this for a reason. And Hashem put us in Egypt for a reason, to put us through the ringer, the Kura Barzel, to form us, to make us who we are. Moms, especially much more than the dads, they're there, they're involved, they're doing, and they're killing themselves, and they have the headspace. Most dads have no idea their kids' birthdays. And they have no idea when's the last time they went to the doctor and if they got their shots or not. That's the mom. And know the, who, who's your kid's friends, and who has play dates, and who's upset, and who he gets along with, who she doesn't get along with. That's the mom. She knows. 
At pitachlo, your job is to get involved as the moms and the grandmothers, to be there for them and appreciate as challenging as it might be. And especially now with coronavirus, ultimately baruch makom. We know that Hashem did this for a reason. He runs the show. He has a plan. And ultimately, it's just going to make us stronger. It's not because they were great that they got tested. It's because they got tested that they were great. Wishing you all a chag kasher v'sameach.